Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into tonight's second half, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they definitely do matter. Now everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half, shall we? All right, folks, in tonight's second half happens to be one of my favorite Dogman experiences. I don't know why, but it really is. When people ask, do you have a favorite? And I do say no most of the time. Um, thinking back on it, the last experience in this upload is probably my favorite. Let's get into it. Dogman and Bigfoot would share their habitat with bear and invariably lead to encounters between the two, and these seem to have the potential to perhaps turn violent under the right circumstances. Although there are few reports that seem to suggest that these creatures typically mostly avoid each other, and that bears will even flee from the approaching dogman or Bigfoot, there are a variety of reasons for why they may come to blows. It may be territory protecting their young or perhaps friction due to dwindling habitats. If these species share the same diets, violent encounters may erupt over competition of a dwindling food supply as well. It could even be something as simple as one being startled by the other and going into an aggressive mode. And one such encounter happened to a hunter who was hunting brown bear on the Russian Kamchatka Peninsula. The hunter had been tracking a very large bear described as being an impressive muscular and blocky specimen measuring 9 feet 10 inches in length and weighing an estimated 1,400 pounds across the remote wilderness for four days when he and his hunting companions came across a rather unusual sight. At an area near a creek, which was overrun with strawberry brush, there was evidence that a furious fight had taken place between two very large creatures, with snapped or level saplings, thrashed bushes, and scattered tufts and clumps of fur everywhere. The scene was described by the hunter as looking as if two bulldozers had gone after each other. The hunters at first presumed that the bear they had been hunting had gotten into a territorial confrontation with another bear, and they continued to track their quarry. The following day, the hunters finally came across the bear hiding in some deep thicket, but it was behaving quite strangely, moving slowly and erratically. The hunter did what he was there to do, shot the great beast and upon inspection of the carcass that things took a turn for the totally bizarre. The bear exhibited horrific wounds that, while not fatal, suggested that the bear had been beaten very badly. Additionally, the wounds themselves were very unusual for a bear fight, with huge tracks of fur pulled out along the stomach and chest, as well as claw marks on their chest and bite marks on the back of the neck and shoulders, 
as if something very po powerful had grabbed it from behind, wrapped its arms around the bear, and fiercely began to bite it. It at first was assumed that it may have been attacked by a tiger, as in Siberia it is not unheard of for brown bears to have altercations with Siberian tigers, and the tigers are even known to actively hunt bears from time to time. But other details seem to defy this idea. For one, the five... The claw marks were too wide and shallow to be those of a tiger and one seemed to be in a posable thumb position. Additionally, the missing patches of fur seemed to have been pulled out as if by a large hand, and neither tiger nor a bear would be able to grab chunks of fur and yank them out like that. The bite marks were also found to be kind of rounded and were in a wide horseshoe-shaped arrangement, similar to that of a baboon or a large canine. On top of everything else, the bear was described as having very extremely odd, overpowering, foul stench exuding from its back that was not typical and which the two avid bear hunters had never experienced. Although wild bears don't smell particularly nice at the best of times, this odor was allegedly something different and, on a whole, another level of revolting. The potent, cringe-inducing odor was described as smelling like weak, old, napalmed water buffalo and wolverine stink. After close inspection of the unusual wounds, including skinning the bear and observing the underlying tissue damage, the experienced hunters could not explain what could have possibly attacked it. It was then that one of the local guides came forward, claiming to have actually witnessed what had happened. The guide claimed that the bear had come upon a strawberry bush and startled a family group of bipedal creatures consisting of a big male described as nine foot tall and roughly six to eight hundred pounds, a smaller female and a juvenile that they were feeding. It was then that this large male had allegedly rushed to clash with the bear without hesitation as the female and the youngster fled to a safe spot. According to the guide, during the brief but violent encounter, the infuriated male had lashed out at the bear with its hands and stunned it before grabbing it from behind and inflicting a series of vicious bites to its neck and shoulder. The bear had managed to shake the creature off and proceeded to deliver several ferocious paw swats as well as a series of bites to its thigh, after which the two wounded beasts both retreated in opposite directions. The locals also claimed that such bites were quite rare but did happen from time to time, especially when the two creatures surprised each other. When the hunter suggested that they track down the wounded beast and its family, the local guides all adamantly refused to go after what they saw as a wounded, angry, protective, and extremely dangerous creature. Then we have this experience coming out of Callum County, Washington in 2004. A gentleman was in the process of having his house painted when his two daughters told him they had heard a loud and eerie sound emanating from the forest behind their house, which sounded, as one of the girls put it, like a combination of a whale and a dinosaur. The following day, on October 12, 2004, one of the house painters reported that two of the surveyors working on the edge of the property had been terrified by loud, vicious growling from the woods, which one of them had said it sounded like two bears having one hell of a fight. It was also claimed that a foul smell was pervading the area that the surveyors were deeply unsettled by this incident. The gentleman described to have taken his dog out to inspect the general vicinity of the alleged sounds and immediately noticed a rotten stench permeating from the woods but could not find any sign of garbage, animal carcass, or anything else that could possibly account for that stench. Two days later, when the surveyors returned to work, the gentlemen questioned them about the incident. They claimed that during the whole fight, 
there had been that terrible smell hanging in the air and that the apparent confrontation had been so violent that the fir tree had been seen to be shaking like a twig from something heavily smashing into it. One of the surveyors claimed that after the fight, one of the creatures, whatever it was, had headed south across the road towards Olympic Mountain in a big hurry, crashing loudly through the underbrush as it went, although he did not get a good look at it when the surveyors took the gentleman to the site of where they claimed the fight had taken place. They flat out refused to enter the area without a gun. And the gentleman went into the brush by himself. The ground and bush there was found to be torn up very badly, indicating that something big had indeed been fighting there. And it was also noted that several branches had been snapped off a large fir tree which were so high up that the 6-1 gentleman was unable to reach them. An examination of the forest floor turned up a potential footprint, seemed human-like with a clear big toe and reported to be measured at 15 inches long, 4 inches wide at the heel, 5.5 to 6 inches at the top. As the gentleman ventured deeper into the forest to an open area nearby, he found more definite similar sized humanoid prints which had toes that seemed to curl into the wet dirt. Interestingly, there were also bear tracks found as well as fur from what appeared to be a lynx or cougar pressed down into the forest floor. Although whether these had anything to do with the incident or not is anyone's guess. The strange haunting vocalizations would continue for several more nights after the incident. The gentleman later researched recordings of alleged Sasquatch vocalizations, and he and his daughter said that what they had heard sounded exactly like a whooping sound recorded in a 1972 Bigfoot sighting in Escadia, Oregon. All right, guys, so now I realize that there are a lot of new people to the channel. And many of you may not have heard the story of Captain the Bear with the Dog Man. So I will share it one last time and only because I shared these very terrifying bear attacks or bear fights with Dog Man and Bigfoot. This is not a report myself witnessed, but instead, one my grandmother told me about that my aunt later corroborated independently, so I think it's trustworthy. At the time, I'll note, there wasn't much talk of Dog Man, as this was about a decade before the infamous song came out. There are talk of wolves or werewolves like monsters in the Appalachians. For a long time, so my aunt and grandmother just always called it the wolf thing creature. For a little background, my grandparents, currently aunt's home, is in the backwoods of western Grayson County, Virginia, which to this day is still sparsely populated outside of one or two large towns on the east side, and back then it was even less extremely thick forest with hilly terrain in all directions. You have to get to on a dirt path and follow it for about a half a mile to get to a gravel colored side road and then follow it for 30 minutes to reach a very small town just across the North Carolina border. If you go a short ways north you'll find yourself at the Blue Ridge Mountains and the parkway that will lead you up to Appalachia proper. The forest is mostly low lying shrubs up to around five, 4 feet high with pine and a lot of black oak making up the canopy. There is a very clear stream about 30 yards from the house which has fish quite frequently. This along with blackberries, tender leaf shrubs, and some apple trees make it very lucrative for wildlife. The house itself is an old two-story home built onto an incline of a hill that it overlooks. This was back in the 70s. My aunt believes it was 78 as she was finishing high school at the time. My father had graduated from college and was going into the Air Force, so he was 
already moved out, my grandfather, although he was old enough to retire, liked to remain busy, so he worked his old job as an electrician and power pole technician, just now in an advisory role because he was getting up in the years. He had just gotten the contract down in North Carolina, so he was away from the house for about a week and a half. This left only my 17-year-old aunt and my grandmother at the house. As I said, there usually was a lot of wildlife in the area. A typical morning for my grandmother was making breakfast and sitting out on her porch watching the deer and rabbit eat the shrubs. Sometimes she would also see or hear a bobcat, fox, coyote. On one occasion, a mountain lion and her cubs strolled right past the house. One animal she was familiar with in particular was a very large black bear who could be recognized by folks around these parts from the white patch on his chest and a hole in his left ear. My grandmother nicknamed him Captain because he had a habit of sitting on his haunches and reaching up with his paws to pick apples, a motion that looked like he was saluting. Captain was a very big black bear and was not very aggressive unless tested. He seemed to have an agreement with my grandmother and grandfather that if they left him alone, he would leave them alone. He just strolled by the house every now and then to have some blackberries on the bushes or apples that had fallen down, which meant he came by the house's yard often as he was too big to climb trees much more and the fruit trees around the house were low enough that he could just reach up and pick them. My grandfather guesstimated he was somewhere between five to six hundred pounds and roughly six feet tall, as my grandfather once measured some scratch marks he had left on the trees. During the week, my grandmother noticed a fairly sh sharp decline in the animals nearby. It was the latter part of summer in the wet season, so most of the plants were in full bloom and the leaves were at their tenderest. Yet she couldn't see hide nor hair of any rabbit or deer coming to graze. A coyote she had heard yapping every night for the past month seemed to vanish. A few neighbors by neighbors, I mean people who lived within five miles, who stopped by told her something had taken their dog and their chicken coop had been smashed into. They assumed a mountain lion that lurked about had done it, since it was the only other thing that could feasibly take down a large farm dog, as they had seen Captain, the only other predator nearby big enough to take down an 80-pound farm dog, the day after in a completely different area, going, gorging himself on a dead deer. They checked around and couldn't find anything. The next night, my grandmother was woken by my aunt, who told her she had heard something bang against the side of the house. They checked around in the morning after and found one of the deer butchered with a bloody smear on the wall. Judging from the way the gravel was disturbed, the deer had been walking by the house when something ambushed it, and in a struggle it got smacked against the wall. My grandmother, having grown up in the woods, was familiar with predatory kills and methods. Mountain lions tend to jump on the back and rake their claws across the flanks to hold on and bite their neck. Black bears will usually just break the neck or the back with their paws while biting the head. And there are rare occasions coyotes attack deer. They usually do it by biting down on the inside of the leg and twisting to rip the muscle and arteries. This kill clearly had the throat ripped out. But there were not any claw marks to be found anywhere. The bite also looked narrower than what a cougar would do. Plus, she could gander there was only one predator from the way the ground had been disturbed, which didn't make sense for coyotes as they typically hunt in pairs since just one alone isn't usually enough to bring down a full-grown deer. After disposing of the carcass, the next few nights were relatively uneventful except for the fact several times my aunt or grandmother would be woken in the middle of the night by the sound of something panting outside of the house. Now in these woods you can hear a pin drop. It's close enough 
at some points they could swear the animal was making a panting sound directly on the outside wall. One day my grandmother was picking some berries when she noticed what looked like dog tracks of a very large hound going through the mud flat bordering a nearby stream. Thinking it may be the missing farm dog who had maybe just ran away, she followed the tracks until she heard something loudly growl at her from across the stream. She looked to see a partially obscured face of what looked like a large, bulky, brown-colored coyote or wolf standing in the thicket on the other side of the stream. She quickly began to back away, glancing back only to check her footing on the slope that led down to the stream. When she looked back, she saw the very distinct canine face in much greater detail because the animal had moved out from under cover. But instead of stepping out of the leaves like she thought it would do, she soon noticed that it was instead standing on its hind legs and peering over the shrubs. Now she had seen canines stand upright before. Dogs do it. Foxes can do it. Coyotes sometimes do it. It was the size that took her off her guard. She had been to that exact same thicket of shrubs just the other day, and her head only just barely reached the top, and my grandmother was around 5'3". This thing had a head pitched clear over the shrubs with a little bit extra visible. And usually when a predator is making no attempt to hide, it's usually because they're trying to intimidate my grandmother managed to back away to the hill without turning around, and when she started to get out of sight, the creature stepped out of the thicket on its hind legs. It strolled forward in a very uncanny way. She had trouble describing, but she insisted it never went back down on all fours. Needless to say, she ran to the house in a backpedaled sprint. That night they heard panting again along with a distant howl and scraping sounds. They found the garage door, back door frame, and kitchen window frame all had claw marks on them from something investigating them. This canine creature was seen a few more times across the week by my grandmother and the neighbors. Usually on or near the area of the family's property, my aunt finally saw it when she saw a pair of fuzzy ears outside her window. Now, she wasn't startled right off the bat from this, as Captain had often come by her window a few times before, and she had gradually lost the fear of the big bear over the years. But in his case, his ears just barely reached the edge of the window sill, whereas in this case, you could clearly see them and the top of the owner's head. She quickly realized that this was not a bear because of the pointed shape, brown coloring, and the fact that they were two fully intact ears. They also started to detect a very pungent smell on the side porch door, one time finding what looked like a urinal or some other liquid stain on it, suggesting the animal had been scent marking it to claim the spot. It all came to a head on a Wednesday night when they heard howling in the distance growing closer. My grandmother flipped on the porch light and glimpsed the canine animal quickly sprinting across the lawn on its hind legs. Her sighting confirmed just how big this creature was. She had seen timber wolves at the zoo up to 150 pounds, and she was certain this was at least a bit more than twice that size. For several hours of the night, they could hear it roaming around the property, pressing against the doors like it was trying to find a way in. They glimpsed at several points of eye shine of yellow eyes piercing through the windows as well as a broad, long-fingered paw being pushed against the glass briefly. This was the day and age before cell phones and 24-hour police service in some areas, so no one had any means of immediately calling the police. Instead, my grandmother had to wait minutes on a dial line with connection difficulty trying to get a call into the police station two towns over. She was distracted by my aunt screaming, running into the bedroom to get one of the guns out. She had been sitting in the living room when she felt clicking against the glass 
and saw the wolf thing staring, pressing its face and baring its teeth, and the surface with its claws fully outstretched. Both of them stared at each other, and they started to try to get their rifles and shotguns out. It was becoming increasingly clear that this creature was trying to get into the house and knew they were there. They heard it panting through the wall before there was even a sound of heavy footsteps and a very loud thump. With a flash of fur on the edge of the window, they ran to the innermost room, the pantry locker, and stayed in there with the guns. Now it's not like in the movies when creatures roar, snarl, and hiss constantly, no matter what they're doing. But they did hear commotion outside. My aunt and grandmother hadn't the faintest idea what was going on and didn't investigate until the morning after. But they could tell something was antagonizing something as occasional grunts, barks, and rumbles were audible through the blackness for about a minute and gradually moved off. They found no bodies, but there had clearly been a fierce altercation. The ground was ripped up in multiple spots, the wall had a dent in it, and there were some oxidized blood traces on the grass and dirt. My grandmother also found a trail where something had charged through the shrubs and recovered several vague dog prints as well as wider tracks moving in the same direction. The animals all seemed to come back by the end of the week and the howls stopped. When my grandfather came back, he, my aunt, and some neighbors surveyed the area to make sure they didn't find the wolf creature. Evidently, neighbors had also heard howls around the property at night and stopped recently as well. They couldn't find it despite surveying the whole property, though they did find what looked like a track way leading out of the property and running off into the mountains. Several days later, my grandmother saw Captain again making, marking his territory by rubbing up against the tree in the yard and scratching the bark. He had several cuts across his muzzle, was missing patches of fur, had some healed bite wounds on his arm, a hole in his ear, that had been torn open to the point he was missing the top half of his ear. But other than that, and a slight limp that went away in time, he was fine. My aunt joked that he looked rather proud of himself. When he was told about the urine-like smell on the doorstep when the wolf creature was running amok, my grandfather speculated that it was trying to claim its territory Usually black bears are relatively docile, but evidently Captain took issue with this newcomer imposing its space and became aggressive. So what my grandmother and aunt heard one night was a bear charging while it was distracted and engaging the intruder. While the wolf-looking creature was taller, it seemed skinnier and less massive, and apparently in this confrontation, the threat displays that likely followed sheer bulk won out. Apparently, it decided it wasn't worth claiming its spot. If it meant having to square off with a quarter ton of claws and teeth, Captain had run the intruder off to protect his territory. Oh, and coincidentally help the family. As a thank you, and so he could recover his strength quicker, my grandmother trimmed the apple trees down, all the fruit, and let the bear enjoy himself without feeding him directly. Don't want to associate humans with food. Winter would be in a few months and she wanted him fattened up so he'd stick around for the next year just in case. As she put it, the forest will always have a boss and it's better to have one who's not interested in eating you. Now decades have gone by and while well, both my grandparents and captain have passed away, the dogman creature never returned. There's been about three black bear who moved into Captain's place since, and each has grown about as big as he was. Thankfully, that seems to have been enough to ward off any large creatures. All right, folks, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's second half as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. See, I told you, I love that experience when Captain just teaches the dog man who's boss. You know, this old, kind of grizzled old bear. Just, 
I don't know, something about it that just makes me smile every time I think about that experience or hear it. So thank you for supporting the channel, guys. Your support is what makes this channel continue to grow and go. And honestly, what gives people a chance to share their experiences, ideas, and theories judgment-free. Please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.